Well, good morning or good afternoon to everyone, wherever the case may be. If you're on the East Coast, obviously this is afternoon. I want to welcome everybody to today's webinar, Emerging Trends, Seismic Shifts Will Require More Than an Incremental Response. This is a special webinar today between FMI and Dexter and Cheney. I'm Andy Holtman with Dexter and Cheney, and in just a few moments, I'll turn things over to Brian Dwyer with the FMI. But as folks are still kind of, uh, you know, kind of trickling in here this morning, I just want to take a few seconds and go over a few housekeeping tips, just in case this might be your first time using the GoToMeeting or GoToWebinar panel. Uh, if this is your first time, you might notice the navigation bar on the right-hand side of your screen. This is how you interact with us during today. Uh, you might see a little orange arrow where you can expand or hide that navigation bar to your liking, but you also want a number of different options available where you can adjust your settings, interact with us, and more. Uh, one thing you might notice is that you are muted. We do have a good number of people on the call this morning, and we mute folks uh, so that everybody can hear. There's no background noise. However, uh, like I mentioned before, you can use that navigation bar to interact by raising your hand, asking a question, or making a comment at any point during the webinar. If you do have a comment or question, uh, type it into those boxes there, and we'll do our very best to answer it. Uh, in today's case, uh, most likely at the end of the webinar. Uh, or if we're not able to, for whatever reason, we'll follow up with folks after the webinar is over and uh, make sure all, all questions are answered. Uh, we are also recording the webinar today, so if you'd like a copy of the recording after uh, uh, it's over, please let us know, and you can type that into the uh, question and comment area too, and we'll make sure to get those out to you. Uh, just a few words about Dexter and Cheney for anybody that might not know. We are a construction software company specializing in business management and operations solutions. We began way back in 1981 being really the first company to bring accounting software to the construction industry. Uh, so we've been around for more than 35 years now. Today we are the leader in cloud-based ER construction ERP software. Our Spectrum construction software is a full suite accounting, business management, project management, equipment management, and service management solution that you can access on any device anywhere uh, so you can get work done wherever work takes you. But one of the other things that we do in the industry is we partner with a number of different industry associations and organizations like FMI to bring a host of educational resources to the industry. Uh, these include things like white papers, webinars like you're on today, videos, blogs, podcasts, and a whole lot more. And you can find these by visiting our website at www.dexterchaney.com. Uh, now, with some of the housekeeping stuff out of the way, I want to turn things over to Brian Dwyer. Uh, Brian's a consultant with FMI. He works across multiple disciplines there and to help contracting firms grow profitably and achieve operational excellence. Having previously worked for several national and multinational general contractors throughout the United States, he has first-hand experience managing large and complex construction projects in both the public and private arenas. Uh, today, Brian's going to share with us some of the emerging construction trends and how they might shape the future of the industry and how companies can benefit by getting out ahead of these trends. Uh, Brian, with that, sir, let me turn things over to you and uh, let you take it away. Great. Well, thank you very much, Andy, and uh, hello to everybody out there. Uh, as you all know, this presentation, as Andy just mentioned, is called Emerging Trends, uh, and it talks about seismic shifts and how they're going to uh, transform the industry. Um, but uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to kick it off with an overview of the state of the market and an economic outlook, uh, followed by some discussion on some re uh, recent technological trends. And then I'm going to get, uh, conclude with, with a uh, few thoughts on some other factors that could have an impact on the industry. But before we really get into things, I think it's probably prudent to first put some definition around what we mean when we say seismic. Um, if you thought this webinar was going to be about a uh, disruptive technology out there that you maybe haven't heard about, uh, sorry, I'm going to have to disappoint you. Um, in a business school sense, the term, the term disruptive technology gets thrown around quite a lot, even in the construction industry. And if you go with a business school sense, a uh, disruptive technology or a disruptive innovation is one that, is so pro that so profoundly changes the landscape of an industry that it, it, it essentially creates an entirely new market and eventually renders the former market obsolete. So think about iTunes or Net, uh, what, what iTunes did to music or what Netflix did to Blockbuster or what Uber did to the taxi industry. Those are examples of disruptive innovations. Um, 
many of the modern technologies that we're seeing, and I'm going to talk about each of these, uh, from BIM to smart buildings to drones to 3D scanning, 3D printing, prefabrication, modularization, and, and the like, uh, they do not actually meet that standard. So I'd just like to be clear on that uh, particular definition. But uh, and in fact, a, a new innovation can actually be called revolutionary but still not be considered disruptive in the traditional sense. Um, but I, although we are starting to see a lot of advancement in things uh, in all those areas that I that I just mentioned, um, I would say you know my theory on why we have not really seen more of the incremental changes we've seen in the construction, more of the changes we've seen have been incremental, because I think a lot of the things that uh, we're trying to bring into the industry, like uh, automa automation and robotics and uh, modularization, all those types of things, uh, they're being because they're being brought over from manufacturing, um, manufacturing is a world where workers or robots are performing highly repeatable tasks in a controlled environment. And at its core, construction is still an industry that requires boots on the ground to deal with those ever-changing conditions that we see out there on our project sites. Um, I, I still think that staying with the times from a technological standpoint is vitally important for a construction firm in this day and age. But um, I just wanted to emphasize that most, if not all, of these advancements are are really tools that allow us to build better projects more efficiently and hopefully more profitably. So what actually do we mean uh, by seismic shifts? And I was given that some thought this morning, and I, and I thought the best way to describe what we're talking about, um, an acronym that FMI uses a lot is, uh, is VUCA, V-U-C-A. And it's a, a term or an acronym originally coined by the military uh, that we use quite often to describe the state of the industry right now. And uh, it stands for volatility, uncertainty, complexity, and ambiguity. And I think it's fair to say that uh, virtually everything in our, in our industry is in some state of flux. Maybe not being completely overturned, but everything is, is changing on, on a lot of different fronts. But that's really kind of what the tone of this, uh, this presentation is going to follow. Um, and that's everything from changes in the skilled workforce, ownership transition, uh, external market forces, uh, vertical integration of firms, and by that I mean more firms are performing uh, functions of design, construction, as well as maintenance. Uh, we've got much more complex uh, delivery systems uh, with integrated project delivery, uh, all the, and, and there's a lot of different variations on that too. So there's a lot of uh, alternative project delivery systems out there. We're seeing a lot more joint ventures, so uh, contracts as a result are getting much more complex. Um, and these are just all uh, a few of the things that are that are affecting the, the current landscape of the industry. So um, again, starting out with a, uh, an overview of the general market. And uh, the first thing, and I, I mentioned it uh, just before, is that, uh, and many of you know this, is that availability of labor at uh, all levels is a, is a major, major concern. Um, the, the shortage of skilled labor, um, again, is no surprise. Uh, the industry really first recognized the declining supply of labor as early as the mid-1980s. They saw this coming. And uh, during the recession, many people in the industry found careers uh, in other sectors. Uh, if you were uh, if you were a welder or if you were an equipment operator, you may have gone over to oil and gas because that's uh, that industry did not skip a beat. They were really just that fracking boom was really just starting to to really take off as uh, we were uh, diving into the recession. Um, but a lot of people have have left and they, and they still have not come back. Uh, baby boomers are retiring at a very very rapid pace. Um, the number of baby boomers leaving the industry uh, is twice that of millennials coming into the industry. Um, so uh, fewer young workers are, are entering, and that's uh, both in terms of the field and, and as well in our project management. And uh, the industry, uh, particularly, at, particularly at the craft level, is uh, becoming more and more highly dependent on, um, on Hispanic labor. So these, these are all um, things that we have to uh, have to contend with, um, and the, the Hispanic workforce is going to really make up the backbone of, uh, of the labor component of the industry, I think, in the, in the next, well, for the foreseeable future. Um, 
A couple other things that we noticed that are on this slide, uh, some interesting tidbits. Uh, mega projects, uh, there's, I, I mentioned the joint ventures, but uh, there's been a major uptick in the number of mega projects out there. From 2005 to 2009, there were only 87 projects over $1 billion in size in the entire United States. Uh, compared to the period from 2010 to 2014, there were 336, so almost a four-fold increase uh, in that, uh, over the next five years. And, um, but uh, what's interesting is that non-residential construction put in place during that 2010 to 14 time period uh, actually went down. So as the overall market was actually shrinking in size, the number of mega projects was, was actually exploding. And it's, uh, it's not a topic of conversation for, for this presentation, but it's probably worth noting that uh, overall mega projects, uh, and again, we're just using the, the figure of $1 billion uh, projects with a, over $1 billion, uh, they have had an absolutely abysmal track record uh, of meeting goals concerning time and schedule. Um, and it, so as these projects get more complex, uh, the risk increases exponentially. and um, there's not, it's uh, more often than not, uh, not everybody comes out on top. Um, there are a lot of technology advances out there, and we are going to talk about some of those, but um, and while we encourage the, uh, that firms embrace new technology, they don't always get the deployment of new technology right. Um, and I guess what I would say is that they, uh, and I'll probably defer a little bit of this to, to later on, but um, um, yeah, I, I guess what I'll say is what we're seeing is that a lot of these firms are using new technology, and if they do it right, they may see some improvements in the field. But overall, we're not we've not observed a uh, a, uh, a um, transfer to the company's bottom line uh, when they when they adopt these new technologies. So it is uh, it's one of those things that um, uh, has to be an investment choice that's made wisely. Uh, risk management, this is a very, very risky business. Um, the tight time frames, low margins, tough contracts, multiple stakeholders, risk of subcontractor default uh, are all part of the, the landscape. So a lot of contractors understanding that are viewing risk as an unavoidable evil and they're not just the, I think the old philosophy used to be that contractors looked at risk mitigation as risk transfer. So how do we write contracts just to deflect as much risk as possible away from us? But now contractors are understanding that if we are best suited to manage the risk, maybe we should be the ones to actually assume that risk. That's one of the old maxims of constructions. We're seeing uh, some contractors, you know, with, uh, you know, forming, cap forming captives around, you know, subcontractor default insurance as opposed to going the, the bonding route, that type of thing. Um, and then finally, uh, mergers and acquisitions, we are seeing a lot of that. That remains strong. Um, I, I think it's uh, one of those things where a lot of clients, uh, a lot of the uh, small owners of small firms, were, they're now nearing retirement age, and their firms are now just starting to get back to a value that they're comfortable at uh, pulling their equity out of the business and selling out, whereas during, during the recession, that just, uh, that just wasn't an option. So we are seeing an, an uptick and activity in, uh, in that area as well. Okay, a uh, few more things on this slide. Uh, I'm not going to talk about the, the low cost of natural gas, but uh, just know that um, but the only point with that is that uh, it actually is a, uh, it lowers our manufacturing costs. So in terms of how much of the electricity we produce is, uh, is, uh, uses natural gas as its uh, primary fuel source. So that does give us a competitive advantage over um, over countries like China and Japan where uh, it actually costs them much more money to, to produce energy. Um, succession is another big issue uh, that we see uh, threatening the con continuity of a lot of firms. Uh, and just back to that point that I just made about a lot of uh, uh, business owners of the uh, baby boomer age, you know, a lot of those guys are getting to be 60 and older and um, they're a lot of them are struggling with uh, with continuity. Uh, we've got an investment uh, banking division at FMI that actually deals with the transaction side of, uh, of people selling a firm, but if they're not looking to do that and they're looking to pass on leadership to someone else, um, 
it's it's uh, a lot of companies are finding that ex extremely uh, difficult to find to find the right person. So um, it, it's uh, again it's it's part of the uh, the complications there. Uh, the commercial building segment uh, continues to be a uh, a buyer's market. Uh, the the market's certainly stronger from a contractor standpoint, but uh, we have noticed that the supply of commercial contractors that are capable of doing the work um, compared to the amount of uh, the capacity of those firms compared to the amount of demand in the market uh, is actually greater. So that means a uh, a lot of fierce competition around getting those 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 big projects there. And uh, as a result, fees, although revenues have gone up, um, contractors uh, the fees that they put on their work, which is usually uh, or sometimes equivalent to profit, um, they have not gone up, at least in the way they document on their contracts, that have not uh, gone up directly. Um, yeah, I think that's all I'm going to talk about on, on this particular slide. I'm going to go on and go through a few of the other uh, highlights from uh, from 2016. So these are projected. These are, uh, oops, sorry. This uh, information is hot off the press. This is uh, FMI's uh, quarter three outlook that we uh, that we publish. Uh, we publish it four times a year. Uh, this actually has not hit the market yet, but these are the projected numbers that we that we expect. So the the highest volume sectors within construction were power, highway and street, or civil construction, and then education. They all hovered around the the ninety billion dollar market mark. Uh, the biggest gainers in terms of percentage were lodging, office, amusement. And recreation, and then the uh, the power industry as well. Lodging and office saw a uh, a big big uptick, but as you'll see on some of the forecast slides later, that's um, that's going to slow down uh, fairly dramatically. And then the weakest segments were uh, public safety, water supply, and then sewage and uh, waste disposal. So we actually record those as, as two different sectors. But uh, I got a little asterisk there just to remind me that. Um, uh, I just read an engineering news record that uh, Congress just passed an $11 billion waterworks funding bill um, to fund a lot of the waterworks infrastructure projects around the country. And a lot of these, um, and not just uh, water supply, but just everything that falls into the, the United uh, the Army Corps of Engineers, so any navigable waterways, dams, locks, that type of thing. I, I don't know a lot of the details on the bill, but uh, I did see that there was just a large uh, funding bill passed. And then in terms of on the left-hand side of the screen there, you can see our, our growth rates. Uh, 2014 and 2015 were, were pretty strong. Uh, growth in the construction industry was actually outpacing uh, the overall economy, so 10% and 11% growth respectively. Uh, but in 2016, we saw a slowdown. We're still growing. That's good, but um, at, at half the rate that we were in the two years prior. So that's definitely something uh, to keep an eye on for sure. Um, construction spending and nominal GMP, um, and you guys can see on the, on the left-hand side there, we've got GDP and billions of dollars, that's, that's the total U.S. economy, and then on the right-hand side, that right vertical axis there, that's where we're plotting uh, volume of construction dollars in, in the billions of dollars. And as you can see, as we go from 2005, 2006 into the recession, construction was was hit much much harder than the than the general economy was, but uh, we've actually uh, come out of it stronger. We, uh, our growth rate has been faster than the overall economy coming out of that. So uh, those lines are are fairly parallel right now. Um, well, they're becoming more parallel right now, and, and it, it looks like we're projecting that from 2017 through 2020 that uh, growth in the construction market will pretty much from a percentage standpoint will pretty much parallel that of the uh, of the overall economy. Uh, a few more just uh, interesting slides on the, on the total industry and, and in terms of spending. Um, these, uh, these blue bars here, I don't know if you guys can see my mouse cursor here, but uh, these represent recessions. Uh, so this, this chart actually goes all the way back to 1964, so uh, almost 50 years or over 50 years of, of data there, and um, uh, and I think I think what's interesting to note here, and we've got each of the different industries plotted here, and you can kind of see which ones took the biggest hit going into, and and then as well as which ones recovered coming out of the recession. And I think as you would expect, going into the recession, residential and non-residential buildings were hit the hardest. 
Non-building structures remained relatively flat, probably in large part due to the stimulus package, uh, a lot of civil works projects that came out uh, along that time. But it's, uh, it's much, uh, those publicly funded civil works type projects, they're much less cyclical than those uh, in the private sector. So you can kind of see where, how each uh, sector of the industry is impacted uh, going in and out of the market. But um, as you can see by this chart, we are very near, uh, we've actually gone beyond pre-recession levels and the non-residential building structure, and we're just about there on the residential side. So um, overall, again, it's, it's, been a, it's been a long recovery, but um, we've been in a long uh, bull market, uh, I'd say, and uh, you know, there's a lot of uncertainty out there right now as to where where things are going. We think that growth is going to, going to continue through 2020, but uh, of course a lot of things could happen uh, between now and then. Uh, jobs and unemployment, uh, this, is the, uh, this is the overall U.S. economy. Um, nothing uh, too provocative here, but you can just kind of see again that, uh, that unemployment rate plotted against employment uh, for, the, for the past, uh, again, going all the way back to, to 1970. We're at a relatively most people would consider, you know, 4.2 percent a a relatively healthy unemployment rate, but that is not the I forget what the actual term is, but I think what is what they call the true unemployment rate, and that just means that they they stop counting people uh, against that unemployment figure who have been out of the workforce for so long that they've just assumed that they've stopped looking for a job. So the the true unemployment rate is. I think is actually uh, up closer to like 15%, but in terms of the way the government measures it, uh, we're sitting at about uh, 4.5 right now. And then if we look at the construction industry specifically, um, on this chart here, we've got the, the blue line is the, uh, construct, is the construction industry, and then the red is the, uh, is the national average. So, and this is just in, in percentage terms, and as you can see, that there was that big, big spike in 2011, 2012. But since then, we've had uh, uh, unemployment has gone way, way, way down. Um, and actually, we've now reached the point where it's uh, about even with the um, with the overall economy. So again, we're seeing a lot of parallels with the uh, with the overall economy. So as the as the economy behaves, so will the construction industry, and uh, that's. That's what we expect anyway. And uh, as you can see there, the construction added uh, almost 200,000 jobs over the past year. So strong growth in employment there, but then again, there's still a lot of uh, positions, skilled positions that are uh, left unfilled right now just because of the uh, availability or unavailability of, uh, of labor. A uh, few other charts. Uh, I thought this one was uh, pretty interesting. This is the the ENR 400, um, you guys are probably familiar with this, the ranking of, of firms, of general contracting firms, um, and this is their share of the total construction put in place. And again, the vertical, uh, they're salmon colored or whatever you want to call it uh, here, but those represent recessions. And um, as you can see, during recessions, uh, I think all with the exception of 2001 maybe, uh, the ENR 400 actually gained market share. So those companies actually, maybe they don't grow in terms of revenue, but in, uh, relative to the overall size of the market, they they actually um, they actually get bigger. Um, during the last recession, uh, they saw about a five percent increase in total market share. Um, but the but again, the revenues are highly they're highly cyclical and. Um, there's not a lot of you know, even with all the consolidation at the even at the top of the industry, uh, we're not uh, you know there's there's ebbs and flows in that as well. You don't see a lot of um, uh, market consolidation at the very top like you typically do um, in other industries. And and it's I think it's it's worth mentioning when you know when people describe the construction industry and and, and why maybe it's difficult for uh, for real disruptive innovation to take place is just due to how fragmented the construction industry is. And um, I, I would say that there's, I haven't done the research on this, but I cannot imagine there is another industry in which the top 400 firms only control 30% of the, of the total market. Usually, usually there's a lot more concentration at the top. Uh, even the very largest construction firms 
have only a very thin slice of a, of a very, very big pie. And of those ENR 400, uh, only eight of those companies actually uh, made it on Forbes list of five, uh, the 500 biggest companies in the United States. So relatively, I mean, it, it's, it's a very fragmented industry. So even, even the biggest companies, they're not that big compared to some of the other big companies that are, that are out there into the general economy. And uh, again, it's, it's a very, very fragmented industry. Uh, there's a lot of different sectors and specialties within it. Uh, geography plays, plays a part, uh, different building codes, different uh, contractual uh, and litigious uh, type issues. So it's, uh, again, I'll just say it's, 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 it's very uh, fragmented and I think that's, uh, I think personally that's a big reason why uh, it's difficult for sweeping change to, uh, to really take hold at a, at a rate that you see in uh, some of the other, other industries. Uh, so this next uh, slide here is contractor profit before tax, and it's uh, it looks a little bit a little bit tough to read, but uh, as you can see, utilities uh, on average uh, are the highest uh, earners in terms of uh, profit percent, uh, right above six percent, with commercial at the bottom, right there at uh, at two and a half percent, even now in in 2015. Uh, that said, they have uh, they have increased. Uh, their profit percentage, but in terms of the amount of risk that you have to take on in this industry, it's not, in a business sense, it, it actually doesn't make, uh, the risk reward uh, proposition is not uh, what is what it is in other industries for sure, but um, even with the gains that we've seen, it's still a very low profit uh, business. Um, but uh, one thing that I, as I was looking at this chart that I, that I thought was interesting is that you know, a lot of contractors will tell us that if uh, if they go if they propose on a project, their the amount of fee that they're able to command is, has not gone up, but we are seeing that their profit margins have gone up. So if we assume that the that the data is accurate, that profits are actually going up, but our gross margin is not, uh, mathematically that can only mean that uh, contractors have not grown their overhead allocation alongside their revenue growth. So uh, maybe contractors are able to do more with less, you know, with new software tools and new technologies. But uh, I will tell you that one of the most common symptoms we see with contractors when we start an engagement is that they're uh, they're too light on their on their overhead. People are are uh, they're stretched too thin, both uh, in the in the overhead functions like accounting. And uh, estimating, if you uh, account that as, a, as an overhead expense, uh, and as a result, uh, they're not able to provide the level of service to the people in the field uh, that's adequate uh, to support operations. So, um, again, if the data is accurate, that uh, I think that's pretty telling um, in terms of what contractors are, are spending their money on. It does not look like it's uh, going towards towards office uh, overhead for sure. Okay, population growth. Uh, we'll spend too much time on this. I did think it was worth uh, uh, mentioning uh, because, if uh, from a real estate perspective, uh, the number one driver of growth, if uh, if you're in the the, the private building sector, uh, the number one driver of growth is um, is population growth, uh, with with job growth or or employment growth being uh, a close second. But uh, also, along with that, migration patterns and, and the growth trends uh, within certain uh, geographies uh, will also play a major role in how decisions around uh, how federal uh, infrastructure funds uh, will be issued. So, um, you know, there's a lot of talk in the election right now about uh, the, de the deteriorating infrastructure, bridges, roads, dams, all those types of things uh, out there, and uh, people understand that there's a lot of money that's got to be spent, but how they prioritize where that money is going to be spent uh, will have a lot to do with um, how the general population is, is, is moving. Okay, a uh, little bit of just commentary on the, on the population growth, and, and, I, and I talked a little bit about millennials and baby boomers, but these are just uh, a couple um, interesting uh, stats here, but millennials are the people that were born between 1982 and 2000 at 83.1 million. They're now 25% of the total nation's population, and it's a, it's a larger generation than, than that of the baby boomers. Um, uh, in 2014, children younger than five became the majority minority for the first time 
uh, meaning that there were over 50%. Um, over 25% of U.S. investors uh, currently in their 60s have more than 80% of their 401k invested in equities or in stocks. Uh, three out of four Americans start claiming Social Security benefits from the moment they turn 62, which I think is the earliest you can claim it. So you can actually, if you can hold out a little bit longer until you're, I'm not exactly sure what the date is, but until you're, maybe you're 67, uh, you'll get a higher uh, payout. Uh, or a higher uh, distribution each month, but uh, that tells us that a lot of the baby boomers are not in as uh, good of a financial situation as they, they probably would have hoped. And uh, a testament to that is a, a recent a, uh, ARP survey of baby boomers uh, said that 40% 40 40 of them plan to work until they drop. So not a very, uh, it's a sobering statistic maybe, but um, it does just reflect the, the reality of things out there in the market. Okay, um, now we're going to go into a little bit of the, the actual economic overview, and I'm not, uh, the, the, the raw numbers on this chart uh, don't uh, really tell a story, but you can see all the categories on the, on the left side there, and those are all the, uh, the sectors that, uh, that FMI measures and, and tracks. And this is a third quarter 2016 forecast based on the uh, quarter two actuals uh, from a few months ago, and this goes out through 2020. But if we go to the next slide, uh, this shows us the growth rate uh, in each sector. So again, um, there was a lot of, it doesn't show 2015 on here, but uh, if you look at like lodging and office, those numbers were actually, you know, in 2016 they were at 18% and 16%, but they were actually much higher in 2014 and 2015. And then you can see going out from 2017 and through 2020, uh, that growth rate actually uh, slows uh, a great deal. So we're not going, all the economic forecasters out there, including FMI, don't think we're going to re-enter another recession uh, before the next election cycle after this one. Uh, but again, uh, back to that VUCA uh, term I used, there, there's a great deal of uncertainty just around this election, regardless of, of who your chosen candidate is. Um, the Fed's uh, unclear strategy around interest rates, that has a huge impact. Uh, the cost of money, uh, this industry, especially in the private sector, is largely driven by uh, the amount that developers can finance the projects for, or what, what their, their cost of capital is. So um, because of this, I think the U.S. economy is, is looking more and more volatile. Uh, a lot of people speculate that the low interest rates that the Fed's been keeping has kind of maintained, has kept stock prices at an artificially high level. Um, but yeah, so it, again, a lot could change, but right now everybody's still holding with the story that uh, growth, but slow growth out through uh, 2020. And just, I know that this uh, graph is, uh, or this chart rather, is a little bit hard to read, but just so you guys know, when I send these, I'm going to send a PDF to uh, Andy at the end of this presentation with all the slides in it, and at the end, uh, at the end of the slides, uh, as an appendix, there is a, uh, a detailed market overview or market summary for each each one of these sectors. So there's probably about another 20 pages or so uh, at the end of the presentation if you guys want to look uh, further into any one of these uh, uh, particular market sectors. Okay, so moving on, uh, not a lot on uh, not a lot of text data on this. On this particular uh, slide, but um, just talking about some of the, the technological shifts that we're seeing in construction, and again, I, I would not classify any of these as disruptive, but rather they are, um, they're, uh, they may be revolutionary, but they, again, they, they are tools that allow us to deliver our projects more effectively, uh, deliver better projects, you know, uh, our, our buildings are much more ener energy efficient now, and there's a lot of a lot more technology being uh, integrated into the buildings that we that we build. Uh, but anyway, some of the technological shifts that we've seen. Um, the first one I got up there is uh, big data and cloud computing, and this was not something that I had actually thought about was a big piece of the construction industry uh, until just a week ago. Uh, the the last ENR that came out, uh, the cover story was was all about it, and um, there's a story in there about how. Uh, Computers now are becoming better at interpreting, uh, you know, the inputs that because because all the the mobile data that we're that we're using out there in out in the field on construction projects, 
software is becoming better at actually aggregating and interpreting that data. Um, and once, once you hit critical mass, those, those systems can start to recognize patterns and they can raise flags in terms of where, uh, you know, warning signs in terms of where productivity might be suffering, schedule or budget might not be meeting plan. Um, but I think this is something you're mostly going to see on, on the larger scale projects where, where having something, having software that's capable of mining big data is actually, uh, uh, it actually makes sense. But um, th that is something that's, um, that, that is being talked about. And they're saying that the, you know, the big contractors that are using this, what it's really helping them do is just learn from past mistakes and, and, not, and not repeat them. So they're able to sharpen their pencils in terms of the estimates that they put together. And, and it's just a better, they've got better baselines uh, to track against. Uh, drones, uh, this is another uh, area that's, that's fairly new. Again, I think it's, they're probably still uh, best suited on the, on the large projects where you're trying to gather a lot of information. And when I say large projects, in this case, I mean actually large uh, projects that consume a large uh, physical area. Uh, so they're using drones to, you know, to actually fly around the projects and, you know, uh, and record uh, work in place, the condition of the site, um, that type of thing. Uh, but I have also seen some architecture and construction firms use drones just as a means of uh, taking pictures and, and getting real nice flybys of the, of the finished product that they you know that they, that they use in their company and their company resume and you know, the, and their portfolio of projects and uh, and that type of thing. But there is some talk out there. Uh, I think we're still maybe a, a ways away from it, but uh, people believe that in the future drones might be able to start uh, you know like Amazon, they'll start delivering uh, materials to the site and um, uh, maybe even, be, you know, set materials uh, in place. Maybe not finish installed materials, but, you know, they can deliver them to the exact location on the job site where they need to be, which will cut down a lot on the, uh, the logistics, which is a, which is a huge uh, time suck in construction just in terms of getting materials into the building, uh, how many times. These are all things that FMI tracks when we do a productivity assessment. How many time this material gets moved before it's put in its, uh, in its final location. So uh, again, opportunities for, uh, for more efficiency. Uh, virtual reality and augmented reality, uh, another more recent application. Um, but I think that you know, with the advancements in uh, building information modeling, and I would not consider BIM a, uh, a new technology anymore. It's, it's, it's certainly the standard. But with buildings being designed in uh, 3D, you can now upload that model. Uh, it, it, or scale it up into a life a life size digital model, and you put on a set of uh, I'll call them goggles, maybe you know, the, like the Microsoft Hololens or something like that. Uh, there's companies out there that are looking into this, and um, and you can actually see what it would be like to be standing uh, inside the building in a virtual environment. And I think from a construction standpoint, uh, in terms of you know seasoned professionals, this is probably most useful if they're trying to coordinate like a really high uh, highly complex uh, mechanical or electrical room, but I think most of what I've heard about it is that these products, the the technology around virtual and augmented reality is more of a value proposition to the client or the end user who maybe isn't as experienced reading construction drawings, but, but it gives them uh, an early look at what their product will look like uh, when it's finished. Uh, prefab is the next one uh, that I have on there. Uh, this is an, another area that I think has benefited greatly from uh, advancements in uh, 3D modeling. Uh, and we work with a lot of self-performing contractors. And I think for a, uh, and they're all looking for uh, every opportunity that they can uh, to do more prefabrication offsite in their shop where they can be more productive and, and, and more efficient. Um, but but say for a uh, for a plumbing mechanical or electrical contractor, if they can uh, build assemblies at their shop, if there is a high level of detail and the, and the class detection and that has been done properly within the model, they can do those assemblies and then when they deliver them to the job site, they can have a, a much higher degree of confidence that the that, that prefabricated assembly will actually fit uh, in the space uh, when it arrives. And then uh, modular construction, I consider this separate from uh, from prefab, this this sector of the industry is still growing, um, but it's not without its challenges for sure. Uh, traditionally, modular construction has been best suited for 
facilities that have a large number of identical or similar room types. So think of uh, hospitals, hotels, apartments, th those types of things. Uh, there's been a, a lot of advancements in modular construction as well that uh, allow for a much higher degree of customization. But, uh, but this sector of the industry still holds a very small slice uh, of the overall market. And I think part of that's probably just uh, awareness. Um, you know, I don't think a lot of uh, you know, private sector owners out there uh, maybe even consider a modular building as, a, as an option. And, and maybe you know, if it's unfamiliar to their design, the designers that they hire, it just never gets brought to the table. So I think that the, the modular industry has, uh, I think it has a bit of work to do in terms of uh, generating awareness around their, their products and, and what they can do and if they can actually add value to the, um, to the end uh, product. So one thing I found uh, interesting, I, I, I read a, uh, a uh, report by the World Economic Forum and, uh, uh, in conjunction with Boston Consulting Group, and, and, and it talked about uh, construction productivity and how it's, it's remained stagnant for really like for two decades. And it, it cites the number one um, opportunity to, to improve productivity is embracing new technology and figuring out how to how to use it. Um, but I was actually, uh, I found this chart here. Uh, this was, uh, this chart came out of a building design and construction magazine and it was a report that uh, KPMG did. And uh, again, th this report did say that uh, firms are slow uh, to embrace new technology in their opinion. But I, these numbers I actually thought were uh, surprisingly high. I'm not exactly sure how they measured it, but it said uh, of the companies that they pulled, 42% actually use drones to monitor construction status. 30% uh, use robotics or some type of automated technology. Um, I'm assuming that has got to be, um, that 30% has got to be more on the uh, uh, the manufacturing side before the products actually arrive on site, but I'm not 100% sure. 65% uh, use remote monitoring on sites. I, I didn't find that too surprising. There's all kinds of options out there. 30% uh, use uh, RFID to track uh, equipment and materials on site. And again, that's one thing the FMI looks at. If a company is using RFID technology, we'll track how many times things actually get moved around the site before they actually get installed. And they'll, uh, they'll use smart sensors to actually track people. And then 61% uh, are now using building information technology, excuse me, on a majority of their projects. Um, and I just think that that's, if, if you're doing any type of design work, you know, even shop drawings, you, you, you've got to have the software now to, um, and you have to be able to work the software um, to, to, uh, to even operate in, in today's market because, like I said, that is the, uh, it's no longer the new thing. It's, I, I'd say it's, uh, it's the standard. So, um, and, and here's the, uh, I'm coming back to productivity because as I was putting this presentation together, I was trying to think, so what is the, the biggest, the number one competitive advantage that construction firms can can focus on, and, and I'd say this is true for self-performing contractors as well as uh, general contractors. General contractors don't typically. I, I came from that from that world, but they generally don't think of productivity uh, as something that's uh, extremely important to them. But um, I think it is the number one uh, key differentiator because you know I think it. You know, in spite of the industry's best efforts to, to decommoditize our services, I think that the fact remains that price is still the number one determining factor for most owners in, in terms of which contractor they choose to go with. So that's not to say that we shouldn't remain focused on enhancing value for the customers through whatever area you want to choose. But uh, being more productive will therefore allow you your your costs will go down, therefore your price will go down, and you'll you'll have lower costs and and higher margins as a as a result. And uh, again, this this uh, this slide just references that uh, that Boston Consulting Group uh, study that uh, that I referenced. But you know, talking about how productivity has actually stagnated over the last uh, two decades, I have. I have some of my own opinions on, on why that is. I feel like the industry with how it feels like it gets more and more litigious every single day. Everything you say can and will be used against you. So I think that precludes a lot of decisions from being made out in the field and everything has to get deflected back to the to the main office, even if the people in the field know what the right answer is. Um, 
you know, that w whenever they reach a point where there's a conflict in the direction that they've been given for the contract, uh, they're dead in the water. Um, so while I think that embracing uh, and fully utilizing new technology presents, I agree that it presents the, the greatest opportunity for improvement in productivity, um, it, it becomes, what I've seen with construction companies that I've worked with is that they don't always do a really good job of uh, of employing that technology or fully utilizing it. They'll they'll always say that, well, the the software may do th it has capabilities that we're not actually using it for uh, that type of thing. And when you know some some companies will just go out and some companies are very reticent to buy technology, especially new technology, especially for the field people. Some, you know, run out and, and buy, you know, the latest and greatest thing. But uh, but choosing, the, you know, the right uh, technology tool, whether, you know, be a software package or, or something else they're using out in the field, it, it is a complex investment decision, not just in terms of the upfront cost, but also in terms of uh, the employee's ability to, to utilize it in the field. So I would say that, you know, construction firms, when they're looking at this, uh, you know, looking at, a potential investment, uh, they need to think very carefully about how they intend to use it, and they need to be able to quantify the added value that they expect to get from it. So in other words, how will this technology make us more productive, and, and by how much? I think those are the types of things that uh, just, it, that's just a good framework for, for contractors to think about uh, any potential decision regarding a, a new, an investment in a new uh, technology. So, what to do next? Um, again, I, I agree. I, I think technology is a big part of this, uh, but you know we've already covered it. Uh, invest wisely, but you know be at the forefront of it. But you know one thing I, I, I would add here is that I, I think where a lot of construction companies fall short is in terms of it being a value proposition to the clients is they don't tie the feature to the benefit. In other words, they'll if they're going, you know, proposing on a new project, they may tell the potential client, you know, all of our superintendents have iPads, we've got the latest and greatest and the best uh, Dexter and Cheney software out there, um, whatever it is, but they don't actually tie that to a benefit to the client, and the client just hears, well, they don't, they don't understand what that means to them. Uh, more, I think it's only been recently that uh, developers and even the public sector have really understood the, the benefits of, of BIM technology to, to their bottom line. Those things where how do we convey to our clients what the benefit of that technology is and why that is a value add to their product, uh, to their end product uh, as well. Um, and uh, I mean, and unfortunately, guys, there's there's no uh, panacea or no quick answers. I think at the end of the day, this uh, remains a very tough business to be in. But I think uh, overall, uh, construction firms need to focus more on on creating organizations that are that are nimble and flexible, so that they can quickly respond uh, to changes in the market. A uh, couple other things that you know, when we make recommendations to clients, especially if they're having trouble with their with their labor workforce, is you know think. Think of avenues outside of you know outside of those areas that you've traditionally looked to to attract and, and, and acquire new talent. That might mean visiting universities, community colleges, and trade schools that you haven't gone to in the past. Maybe outside of the geography that you're in. Um, but I think it also means uh, that you have to create an environment that attracts the best workers. Because uh, you know, as you guys know, uh, the guys in the field they know guys who work for other companies as well. And generally, uh, the best uh, talent uh, out there in, in the skilled labor world, uh, they want to work for the best companies because that oftentimes means uh, there's more in it for them. Uh, it's less stress at the end of the day, and, and maybe they get more uh, financial reward from it as well. So I think you know, focusing on creating a good work environment, and that'll be especially important with uh, you know with the millennial generation as well, because as as you guys, I'm probably not telling you anything you don't know. I'm. I am actually a millennial. I'm as old as you can be and uh, still be considered a millennial. But um, uh, you know, millennials are changing jobs much more frequently than than in generations past. And uh, you know, they just look for a lot of different things uh, things in an in an employer than uh, maybe their parents did. Uh, it's not just about having a stable job, but it's uh, you know, uh, 
enjoying uh, where you go to work every day and not having your reward or your feedback just be a, a paycheck at the end of the day. Um, succession planning, uh, this is something that you know, a lot of contractors don't really think about until they're right up against it. You know, again, with millennials changing jobs at a much higher frequency, uh, this becomes an even more significant challenge in terms of who are you going to pass the, the company on to, who's, uh, who's best suited for that, and who should you groom for that. Uh, and then also, you know, in terms of, uh, you know, the, even if you were not thinking of passing the company on, if you wanted to sell it, a lot of companies may come to a rude awakening that it's just not worth as much as they originally thought. Unless you're an asset-heavy contractor, like uh, like an equipment uh, contractor, um, heavy equipment contractor, uh, without a lot of assets, and a lot of you know people will look at a you know a five times multiplier on earnings of the value of a company, but uh, construction companies typically aren't valued that way. So in order for owners to it becomes a big challenge for owners to pull their equity out of the company if, if they intend on, on selling it, whether that be to another company or whether they're going to sell out to whoever is going to take over the company um, after them. Uh, be selective in the projects you, you pursue. Project selectivity is, is a big one. Um, when we talk to contractors that are, that are looking to you know, maybe get into a new market sector, you know, oftentimes they'll, they'll buy jobs or they'll take them at their cost or, or maybe even below their cost uh, and, and to just try to get their foot in the door. But if they're going after a project that's an unfamiliar product type with an unfamiliar customer or maybe it has a different type of contracting or, or delivery method that they haven't used in the past, they can often become bigger losers than they uh, even anticipated. Um, so again, being not swinging at every pitch uh, is important if you can position your company to where you don't have to do that. Uh, that is optimal. And then finally, the, the, the last bullet there, understand the market that you're in and, uh, and have a strategy. Uh, I'll, I'll put a, a, a shameless plug for FMI in here. This is one of the things that we work with contractors to do is, uh, to, is to develop a, a strategy. But um, a lot of times when we go in with a new company, uh, when we start an engagement, you know, they may tell us that they have uh, a goal, a lot of times will tell us that they have a goal of reaching a certain revenue target within a given time frame, usually like five years. And the first problem with that is that they're just focused solely on, on top line growth and not bottom line profitability. And, uh, you know, the vast majority of contractors lose margin as they grow because they're not, they're just not chasing the right projects and they're not, they're not growing uh, smartly, I'll say. And, and the second problem is, is that that the goals that contractors form, they're usually not based on any awareness of their position in the market. So, you know, if you're picking a, a revenue target that you want to hit in a certain number of years, e even in a market that's growing, uh, you need to know uh, how much of the market share you currently have. And if you grow concurrently with the market, where will that get you? And if it's not going to get you to your growth target, how much additional market share do you have to capture in order to get you to that number. And that usually require, requires a different strategy than, than what you've uh, been doing in the past. Oh, duplicate slide there. So guys, that's uh, all that I got. It's just about on time, it's 11.53 Mountain Time. So I'll hand it back over to Andy. There's uh, my picture, my little bio, and there's a bit about FMI there. And then again, uh, all these appendices, there's a bunch of other slides back here. and. Uh, um, these will all come out uh, when we distribute the slides from the uh, from the presentation. And um, yeah, here we go. Uh, for each one of those sectors that we have in our market forecast, there's a more detailed uh, summary uh, in the appendix. So with that, I'll turn it back over to Andy and uh, open it up to any questions that might be out there. Thanks, Brian. Uh, great presentation as, as always. Uh, just a quick comment to, to make here. Obviously, for throwing things in from the software for, uh, side of things. Uh, one of the things that we're noticing is that a lot more companies are starting to move over to uh, more complete platforms, ERP, enterprise resource planning packages in terms of software rather than trying to manage uh, different disparate multiple software systems. One of the thing that, things that that does is it saves a lot of time in, in, in you know, eliminating duplicate data entry. It saves uh, it's an overall lower cost of ownership for the software and it really kind of helps increase productivity from, from that end as well. 
that's one of the things I'll I'll add from that standpoint. So uh, mid-sized to larger contractors, a lot of them are moving to that kind of model for looking for the uh, all-in-one platform of software management for their business management and financial management. I, we, folks, if you have questions there, go ahead and type them into the question box. We have a few questions here. Uh, one of them, and Brian, you touched a little bit on this, but uh, the skilled labor gap. Uh, you talked a little bit about the 200,000 jobs added, uh, but not all these are skilled workers. How do you feel that this is going to affect uh, projects and growth moving forward with that skilled labor gap right now? Uh, that's a really good question. Um, I mean, I know here in Denver, there's there's a lot of private sector growth, and there's a lot of uh, big infrastructure projects in the work as well. And there's um, the projects themselves are are suffering as a result in terms of budget, in terms of schedule. Um, and and you'll see. Um, I mean, I I think that the the negative impact that it's going to have is. Uh, I hate to say it's unavoidable, but there certainly will be some impact, and there will need to be some type of response from the industry in, in getting uh, people trained uh, much quicker, whether that's through, if you're a union contractor, through that avenue or you know, through uh, any other type of uh, training. But a lot of you know, the industry has relied so much in the past on those, um, you know, on those, on those trade schools to, to train the people. They're just not built to, um, you know, to make somebody who's out of high school um, into, an, into an electrician. Um, and I would say even on the general contracting side, uh, in some you know, the really, really hot markets like uh, San Francisco, I won't mention any uh, names, but there, there have been some uh, terminations um, for default uh, of uh, some very, very uh, big, high-powered, reputable reputable contractors, and um, from what relatively little I know, um, one of the contributing factors was that there were just uh, people in, you know, management positions, project management positions that just weren't ready to be um, in charge of projects of that, that magnitude. So, you know, it's, yeah. I think it's going to have a negative impact, but I think, you know, firms have to, again, look for ways to attract people from other areas and then you know, build, figure out ways to, to build their skill set internally. Okay. Another question here, which you might have already kind of answered, but I'm just going to re, re-ask this question anyway. Where do you see commercial construction headed over the next few years, uh, both for office and retail? You also mentioned an outflow of workers as compared to inflow. Do you see this trend continuing for the next several years? Um. So in terms of the outflow that I mentioned, that was really when when the recession hit, and we just haven't seen that. You know, we've added jobs, but we haven't seen a lot. A lot of those people that left just haven't um, haven't come back. Um, I, I'm sorry, I, I kind of lost my train of thought there. What was the, what was the first part of the question? Uh, the first part is uh, where do you see commercial construction headed over the next few years, uh, both for office and retail? So, um, I mean, again, I would have to just defer, you know, the best information I can give you is, is, is what our, our forecast says, and that's, that's slowing. Um, I think the, the brick and mortars are, are really up against it with the online retailers that are out there. Um, I, I know, like, in, uh, like even in, in Denver where I live, uh, some of the more high-end stores, like, you know, a restoration hardware, or Saks Fifth Avenue, they no longer have multiple locations in a city. They just have one kind of a flagship store. So, um, you know, I think a lot of, um, you know, in some areas where the economy is growing, you know, there's some there's some retail and uh, office construction going on. But uh, you know, a lot more jobs can be done remotely now. And uh, I, I think those those two factors um, combined are. are along with the slowing economy overall are probably the two contributing, uh, highest contributing things there. Okay. But, uh, oh, good. Uh, you talked a little bit about, uh, go ahead, yes. Never mind, I was just telling you to, you to go ahead. Oh, sorry. So uh, you talked a little bit about prefab and BIM and modular construction. Uh, one of the things that's come up recently is kind of a new emergence in, in construction is the idea of 
3D printing and construction. Do you see that as becoming a, 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 a bigger part of things moving forward? It's a really good question, and I've given a lot of thought to that, and I'm not entirely sure why it, other countries uh, have adopted it much faster than, than we have. I know, you know, China's already, you know, produced some really nice high-rise buildings that were all modular, and, they, and they've, you know, done, uh, you know, they've been able to, you know, using a 3D printer, they've developed, you know, a whole plot of land and put whatever, 80 houses on it and like a tenth of the amount of time. And my thought is that, you know, it, in the, for lack of a better term, more developed world, I just don't know that there's the demand in the market for it. And personally, I've never set my eyes on a, personally, uh, first person on a 3D printed building, but I would imagine that it, if you're talking about a house, it may just not be a house that people in the, in the United States would want to live in. And I think the other part is just the, um, you know, the technology uh, piece of it. I I'm not exactly sure what the upstart cost would be, but um, you know, I just again back to the you know all the varying building codes and all the the complexities of, of construction in the U.S. I just think are some of the the barriers to it. That's not to say it won't ever happen, but um, it, it just I feel like if if there weren't some significant barriers to it, it it, it would have we'd see more. Uh, 3D printed projects uh, in the state. Yeah, that makes perfect sense. All right, well, folks, we are past the 11 o'clock hour now. Um, I do want to thank Brian so much for taking the time today and to all you for taking the time out of your busy schedules to attend today. Uh, we always enjoy doing these uh, these webinars with FMI. Uh, they bring so much to, to the table whenever they do. Um, folks, I'll leave this uh, webinar going for about the next you know, minute, maybe a minute, minute and a half or so. Uh, if you would like a copy of the recording of today's webinar and the uh, slide deck that uh, Brian talked about, just go ahead and uh, type into the question box there. Just say uh, yes, please, or more. Or, uh, you know, we'll do our best to get those out to you within the next day or two here. So, uh, with that, uh, Brian, do you have anything else that you'd like to add? Nope. I'm All good. right. Well, folks, uh, like I said, we'll leave this open for about another 60 seconds or so, and then we'll shut it down. But uh, thank you, everyone, for joining us today. And, uh, Brian, great presentation as always. Thanks, folks. Thank you very much. Bye, everybody.